Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Not exactly your typical Christmas text, but the Lord has a word for us in Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Just how many Hallmark Christmas movies are there, you think, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I read a funny last week, uh, Hallmark made 547 movies using a total of 17 actors, <laughs> five locations, and three plots, right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't really uh, hate those things. I, I can get sappy with the rest of them, but uh, here's the deal. Christmas, and I love it. I love all the beauty of Christmas. I got the joy of turning the lights on this morning and, uh, and all that. I, I love it. I love all the, the warmth and the, the beauty of it and all the traditions. But let's face it, Christmas can get a little soft. And um, I mean, we've got more sweaters in this room today, you know, than any other day of the year. And, uh, and, and, and they're all beautiful, by the way. Um, but, but Christmas can get a little, little tender. And today's text, asking the question, why Christmas, reminds us that although it is very tender, it's also a powerful, powerful thing that the Lord did at this thing we call Christmas. So let's look in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to go back to the very beginning here with Adam and Eve. Genesis 1 and, and Genesis 2 describe the same thing from different perspectives in a different way. And so, if anybody ever tells you Genesis 1 and 2 are in conflict, then you know to turn your radio off. Um, but here we go. We're in Genesis 3. And so, we get to the end of this description of all that God has done. And here we are in the Garden of Eden, the most wonderful place in all the world. When I read Psalm 1, I think of the Garden of Eden there between the two rivers, the two mighty rivers that we still uh, have post-flood, lush, beautiful. I'm not a scientist, but I can't help but believe there might be some connection to uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden that got buried in the flood, and there's no coincidence that it's an oil-rich region today. Again, I don't know about all that, but it just, I wonder those things. I mean, this was the place, and that's where we pick up here. Now, the serpent, which we know from the rest of the story, is, is the devil was more crafty, and the devil's speaking through, working through a physical animal, more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, and there it is. He's been asking that all throughout history, attacking the Word of God. Has God said, did God really say, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, oh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will not die. Or you will die, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Just making sure you're with me this morning, that's all. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? And have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And of course, the Lord knew. The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me from the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, 
More than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Now, we're going to pick back up there here in a few minutes, but let's set the stage for what's happening here. Again, here are Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Everything is perfect. They have no sickness. They have no need. Their relationship with God is perfect. Their relationship with each other was perfect. This was the last time that a marriage had no issues. So if you think your, your marriage is the only one that has issues, you no. Know, after Adam and Eve, we've all had issues, issues the Lord can help us with. But here they are, every single thing is great. And at this point, as far as they knew, there was no need for Christmas. Well, that changes. The devil becomes and he begins to question God's Word. He comes after Eve. He's trying to find the inroad there, the devil we know. One of the angels fallen because of his rebellion against God, and God cast the devil out of heaven before creation, and he threw out with him the angels who were following in his rebellion, and they are his demons. And from that moment on, the devil has come against God. He wants to come against everything God wants and everything God does. And so he's trying here in the beginning, right in the beginning, he always has to come and mess everything up. Right in the beginning, he wants to try to find where is the soft spot. And so he chose Eve. And he comes to Eve, and he doesn't say, hey, Eve, has God said, which he did, you may freely eat of everything in the garden except for that one tree. And you see, God sets parameters for our own good. God creates things the way that they're supposed to be, and He knows the way that we can most enjoy them. This is true for those of you in your twilight years. God's parameters are still there. He still knows the very best way for you to enjoy life. It's true for those in middle years. It's true for those teenagers stuck with those crazy parents. And God has spoken and is speaking through your parents, and God knows the parameters that He set there for your own good. But the devil comes against it. And so the devil leaves out all the good, and so he goes right for the negative. Hey, Eve, isn't it true, or is it true what I heard that God said, you can't eat from that really good-looking tree over there? That's what he does. He helps us to forget about all the good that God has given us and focus on the one thing. Now, parents, we don't like that when our kids do that. We, we take them to an amusement park, and on the way home, they complain about the one thing. Nobody likes that, and God surely doesn't either. Well, as someone said, Eve at this point only had two verses in her Bible, which wasn't written down. That was verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2. The Lord commanded the man, saying, from any tree, any tree of the garden. This is the best buffet you've ever seen in your life. You eat freely. Don't just eat a little bit. Have as much as you want. Verse 17, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day you, shall, you eat of it, you will surely die. That's all Eve really had to know at this point in her life. We don't know what happened behind the scenes. We know that in Romans chapter 5, Adam gets the blame. So we don't know if Adam dropped the ball here and forgot to tell Eve the only rule that they had in all of the garden, we don't know, but Satan goes after her. And so she says, and by the way, Satan is using the name for God here that is less familiar, less intimate, and the woman repeats back after him. The woman says to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, she leaves out freely. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it or touch it. God didn't say that. I mean, she's only got two verses, and it hasn't been that long, and she's already forgotten and adding to and taking away from what God has said. I mean, it's like the devil is trying to get in there and help her to think that her lot in life is bad. I mean, this is not, she's not shopping with a bad debit card at Smith's here. She's in the Garden of Eden, and the devil's starting to help her to think I don't know if the Garden of Eden is really that great after all. And so the devil senses he's got something going here, so he keeps on pushing. The serpent says to the woman in verse 4, he says, Eve, you've got a bum deal here. 
Eve, 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 I can't, I'm really, I can't believe what God has done to you all. Eve, you're not going to die. God's playing a trick on you. If you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eve, you'll be like God's and you'll know everything. You see, it's good. Well, Eve is losing quickly. She is dialoguing with the diabolical and it's going downhill fast. But the fatal blow happens here. Eve takes another look at that tree with the fruit on it. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she sees it a different way now when she stops to look at it. The Bible is replete with warnings to us to not look at, gaze at, reconsider the things that God has already said no to all the way through. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon a young virgin. Jesus said that when we look upon someone to lust for them, we've already committed adultery in our heart. We're told not to look to the right or the left. Israel was told, don't look to the heathen king and think that that would be better for you to have a human king. And on and on, the Scripture tells us that when we stop to look at it and we know God's already said no, we're losing the battle fast. Now, it's never too late to get away from sin until the very end, until we commit the sin. But it gets harder and harder, and the way gets more narrow and narrow. We need to say no right at the very beginning. So, in verse 6, the woman now sees it in a different way. Eve says, well, now, that's interesting. I never thought about that tree being good for something. The devil will take sin and temptation in my life and in your life, and he'll recouch it. Well, you know. I know God said a long time ago, that's not good, but do you know that they've discovered that it's actually healthy? It's good for you. Oh, sure, God didn't like it, but now we've discovered that when you drink that, when you do that, it's actually healthy. It can take away your stress. It can do this. It can do that. He's just masterful at recrafting and recouching the terms. So Eve says, you know, I never thought about it. It's actually good for food. It's a delight to the eyes. It's desirable to make one wise. I mean, what could be wrong with that? Oh, God, the fuddy-duddy, he didn't know. He was holding out on us. And so she took it, and she ate it. And it says that she also gave it to Adam, who wasn't far away. And how long do you think that fruit, we call it an apple, we don't know exactly what it was, How long do you think that tasted good? Based on my experience with sin, I'd say about half a second. And then immediately, the guilt and the shame came flooding in, and they realized that they were naked. You see, the devil is full of half-truths, which we call lies. Yes, they did gain, and a new knowledge of good and evil, but it didn't gain them anything. And here's the point at which sin entered our world. And we can't blame them because as soon as we got a chance, we did the same thing and we sinned against God. But here they are. It was a quiet, quiet dinner that night, don't you think? When they began to realize what they'd done. And who was the, to blame? Well, they both were. Adam gets the ultimate blame. He was, he was there. He was supposed to lead his wife. He didn't. We don't know all the, the background, exactly what happened, but, but things weren't that good anymore. And they realized about good and evil and that they were suddenly, they realized they were naked. And they made little loincloths that God's going to say, yeah, and that's not what I had in mind here in a few verses. And then God comes and they hide from God. We've been there. When you say yes to sin, that's the same feeling that you have and that I have. And I've taught you well, the theological term for that is yucky. It doesn't feel good. That's actually a good sign. When you as a believer sin against the Lord, and we all do, it ought to feel that way. Well, what does man do in response? He blames. God comes, and they hide themselves. And God knew where they were. God wasn't trying to find them. God wanted to call them to account. You see, God created them in this perfect Garden of Eden. He created them, and He wanted to enjoy fellowship with them in the most intimate way forever and ever and ever. Now, he knew what was going to happen because he knows all things, but still his desire was that they enjoy that forever. God's not happy. 
because that fellowship is now broken. And so God comes and he basically says, we need to talk. Adam, where are you? Not physically. I know where you're at. What's going on here, Adam? And Adam says, as we humans do, it's her fault. She did it. And God's not satisfied with that. God's going to give Adam his marching orders, the results of the fall in Adam's life, and certainly the results of the fall in Eve's life, and Eve blames the serpent. I want you to do something. I want you to take your Bible, and if you're using an electronic copy, take one of those Bibles in the pew there in front of you, if you will. Take a Bible, and I want you to pinch in your fingers, if you can find Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and just pinch them together about like this. Find a physical Bible if you can. And pinch them together, chapter 1, 2, and 3. If you can't get a hold of a Bible, just pinch your loved one who's sitting next to you. <laughs> In what's probably your left hand, that's how long the earth was perfect. And now what's, I guess, in your right hand, that's what's left of the world in recorded Bible history. That's how long it takes for us to turn against the Lord. Man blames. There's a judgment. And then what did God do? If I was God, and maybe if you were God, we'd be tempted to say, hey, you know, that's it. Adam, Eve, this whole human thing. Look, already... I, the first two chapters are just description, so the only action by man gets to really, uh, the, you know, the chapter three, and you already blew it. Never mind. That's probably what I would do. But praise the Lord, that's not what God did. What God did was promise Christmas. Boom. In the face of all that they had done, He'd given them everything, and He's given us everything. We don't live in the Garden of Eden, I get it, but spiritually, He wants that same intimate fellowship with us. He created us so that He could know us, so that He could bless us, so we could walk with Him. That's what He wanted with Israel. He wanted Israel to walk so closely with Him that all the world would look and see, what is it with Israel? And they'd say, because of the God whom we serve. He wanted all the kingdoms of the earth to believe in Him and to use Israel in that way. And He wants you, He wants me to be that same display that people would say, what is it? What do you got in your life that gets you through the same things I go through and in a different way? Oh, you're not perfect. Yes, we, we, you're not perfect, of course. But there's something different, and it's not that you're a vegetarian. There's something deeper going on in your life. No offense to vegetarians, you'll learn to shoot and hunt later. Um, I, know, I know that just lost me five friends, but it's just, I'm sorry. No, I, it, hey, vegetables are good. You, you keep at it. But <clears throat> back on track, back on track, back on track. He wants that. He wants you and me to know him that way so that we are that example for folks to say, I want to know what you have found. But we turn away, and we sin. And in the face of that, God says, you know what I want to do to you? Yeah, there's effects, there's, co there's, there's consequences of your sin, but do you know what I really want to do to you? I want to give you a Savior, and you're going to call it Christmas. And that's what the New Testament, this morning, in my quiet time, reading in Ephesians 2, ramping up there, getting close to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and 10, it struck me in Ephesians 2, 5, this morning in my quiet time, even when we were dead spiritually in our trespasses and sins, even then, nothing to offer except sin against Him. Even then, because if we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He made us, it says, alive in Christ, which reminded me of Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated, showed, proved His love to you and to me in that after we cleaned ourselves up, put on our Sunday best, came to church and quit sinning? No. God proved, demonstrated His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. That's incredible, and we've become used to it. We've become familiar, accustomed to that message, that the God of the universe created everything perfect and beautiful. We still sinned against Him, and in, in the face of my sin against Him, He died. He died on the cross. I came to, to Christ. I've told you this before, but I came to Christ listening, uh, Pastor Kim, to an old Dallas home and praise, 33. And he knew me then was the song that when he died on the cross, he already knew who I'd be. He knew that I would grow up in a Christian home and in spite of that, think that the world had something to offer to make me happy. And he still chose to die. So here in Genesis 3, God says then in verse 15, and it, it reads, it doesn't read like the powerful declaration that it is that before eternity began, from eternity past, before time began, before creation, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever ago, God knew that He would do what He's going to promise in verse 15. He says to the serpent, and I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and that seed being Jesus. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. You're going to nip at him, Satan, but he's going to crush your head. There it is, the first promise of Christmas, the first promise of the Messiah. And then when we read the Christmas story, we read in the Gospels of Jesus' birth, it is as according to the promise. And the first promise was Genesis 3.15. There it is. That's Christmas. That's the why of Christmas. We, we love Christmas. We're thankful for it. But when you see the baby in the pictures, in the art, in the manger scene, oh, it's, it's, it is 100%. Jesus was 100% man, 100% God. So it is a tender. He was a tender baby who needed his human mother. He was 100% human. But at the same time, when you see Christmas, you know that it is a powerful, earth-shaking, monumental, miraculous move of an Almighty God. Pastor Kim mentioned it this morning. When you see the baby Jesus, you can also know simultaneously that He is wonderful. He is the Counselor. He is the mighty God and the Prince of Peace. You see, Christmas is for uh, little children and for those of us who like the tender, but Christmas is also for the tough guys and the tough gals because it's Almighty God who created man and could have just said, forget it. But Almighty God loved us and promised and made covenant with us that He would never leave us or forsake us. And if He can meet your biggest need ever, and that was your need for salvation. Because without the rest of your Bible, we're sunk. We're just dead spiritually, physically, and then eternally. But He met your biggest need you'll ever, ever have. And there's a room full of folks. Some of you are having the best day of your life. Some of you are having the worst day of your life, and some are in between. But whatever need you walked in this room with, remind yourself today as you see the Christmas lights and decorations. He already met my biggest need. Can he not meet all the rest? There's some here today, some watching online. You don't know Christ as your Savior. Oh, you love Christmas, but you've never really considered why Christmas. It was a response of, to my sin and to your sin. And today, in this room, watching online, live or later, you need to stop and say, this Christmas is the Christmas that I come to Christ. This Christmas is the, the time when I finally realize that religion doesn't get me to heaven. Being good doesn't get me to heaven. Being a church member, good as that is, doesn't get me to heaven. I've got to know Christ for sure as my Savior. And today, you just pause, and you just voice it in your own way, but God, I, I know that you love me. I know that I have sinned against you, and I know that you died in my place on the cross as the fulfillment of the Christmas promise. Would you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior forever? In a moment, we'll pray and we'll sing. And if you're in this room, you could come and let us know that you've done that. 
Some today, you need to come and say to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Or you've been a part of this church for a while and God said, this is to be your church home for this chapter in your life. Or many other things that God has spoken to you about. Maybe your attitude. Maybe you're letting the devil tell you that there's that one thing that God won't let you do and therefore he's messing your life up. Because once you do that, you'll start to focus on that one thing. There are many ways that God may be moving in your heart today, but that you'd respond to this God who gave us Christmas. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths that are so true every single day and so good to be reminded of at Christmas. Father, I pray for the one who doesn't know you as Savior, that today they'd come and say, I want to nail it down. I want to know for sure that I know Christ is my Savior. The one at home, that right now in their living room, their car, wherever they're at, they could nail it down and know you for sure. Lord, there are other things you've laid on our hearts today. Help us to be those who say yes and step out to follow you as you lead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.